Come on in and let's, uh, let's take a seat. Let's get started. Uh, welcome to Calvary Presbyterian Church. It is great to have you here with us this morning. My name is Tom. I'm the pastor uh, here. And um, come on in, sit down. And, and let me invite you to take your uh, bulletin. If you didn't grab one, I'd invite you to do that. They're on the table in the foyer or with one of our uh, greeters. But let me just draw your attention to uh, a couple of the announcements on the back of this uh, bulletin, some things that are going on. First, today, uh, after the service, we have our fellowship lunch. Um, this is uh, something that we do during the school year on the first, uh, the first Sunday of the month in conjunction with our celebration of the Lord's Supper. Um, and so uh, if you've planned on coming and attending, uh, then wonderful, great. This is just a reminder for you to, uh, to come downstairs after the service. If you didn't, if you came in and say like, oh, they're having lunch today, um, join us. Uh, you are welcome. This is, there was no reservations required, um, and, uh, and there'll be plenty of something for everyone to, to eat. So just, just come on down and join us after the, uh, after the service today. Um, number two, um, Vision Sunday. Uh, just another reminder, we'll be announcing this each week uh, over the next couple of weeks. Uh, every year at the end of January, we have our annual congregational meeting. Uh, and I'll tell you in a second a couple of things that we're going to be doing at that congregational meeting. Uh, but, but it's really more than just an annual business meeting. It's an annual reminder for us to reflect on why we're here and why we exist as a church. Um, and so what we do is we turn that day where we have the congregational meeting into what we call Vision Sunday. Uh, a reminder of why, we're, of why we're here. And so we have a, a special uh, guests that will come during our Sunday school time who will be uh, talking to us about one of the ministries that our church uh, supports, uh, something that, that helps us see vision-wise beyond ourselves. Um, and then during the worship service itself, the sermon that week will be specifically focused on something that is core to us as a, as a church. Uh, and then following the service, we will uh, have our annual congregational meeting. Now, technically speaking, that congregational meeting uh, is uh, is, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of required, it's definitional. If you're a member and you're able to be here, well, then you should, you should be here um, because it is for the members of this church to help conduct the business of this church and understand their responsibilities and participating in the things that the church is, uh, is doing. We will, um, normally every year, we will uh, receive and, uh, and hear presented the annual budget for the church and update on the church's uh, financial positions and situations. We'll review ministry reports, talk a little bit about uh, what the, uh, the future might hold in various different areas and categories. Uh, we also, if there are uh, people who are up for election as officers, we have officer elections sometimes at this congregational meeting. Uh, this year we will be having uh, uh, an election. There is a nomination for the office of elder, uh, Dr. Andy McGinnis. Uh, if you're a member of our church, um, then you should have received an email um, just a couple of days ago with more information about that process and with further background on Andy and how the elder process uh, works. Um, if, you're, if, you, if you didn't see your email, um, check it. Um, if you don't do email at all, and, there, and there's, a, there's a couple, but only a couple, if you don't do email at all, um, then see me and I can, and I can help get you what you, uh, uh, what you need. Uh, but that information was sent out and we will. We'll be, we'll be, we'll be doing that at this upcoming congregational meeting. Uh, the other thing that we'll be doing at this upcoming congregational meeting is considering uh, some adjustments and changes to our bylaws. Uh, these are, uh, to be perfectly honest, a little bit overdue in terms of looking at our bylaws and how they match up with the way that we kind of currently do things, cleaning up some uh, grammar and some other kind of uh, phraseology and trying to simplify things. Uh, but there's a number of them. They too were sent out to the congregation the other day uh, if you're a, a member of the church um, and you should have received that in your email. Again, if you didn't, um, and take a look at it, take a look at your email, uh, see me uh, if, you, uh, if you need more information and I can get that to you. But those are, those are business kind of items that are important to note, things that we will be talking about at the upcoming congregational meeting. Uh, all right, so next announcement on the list. Uh, youth night, um, periodically um, and hopefully uh, with even more regularity, we're getting together the middle and high school students for a night of fun and uh, fellowship and study. We're going to be doing that for anyone who is available on uh, Sunday the 21st, 630 to, uh, to 8. So hopefully uh, uh, if you are available, you'll be able to, to join us that night. Um, and then the last thing in terms of coming up that I'll mention, uh, things on the calendar, exploring Christianity. Uh, we did this in the fall, uh, and we have been talking about in our adult Sunday school class uh, over the last couple of weeks 
how we engage and talk to people around us in the world about what Christianity believes and what uh, they might believe. Well, this course, this three-week course uh, called Exploring Christianity is designed to be a tool, an aid for you in that process. Uh, as you engage uh, other people around you um, about what Christianity believes, uh, there, this three-week exploration is intended uh, to provide you a tool, something to invite them to and say, hey, come along, our church does this thing uh, where our pastor kind of goes through some of the big questions of life. Um, and they are the big questions of life that everybody asks. Week one, we talk about who am I and why am I here? Our meaning, our purpose, our identity. Week two, we talk about what's wrong with the world and what makes it right again. What is the problem that we see around us and how is that problem fixed? And then week three, we talk about is there anything to hope for in the future? And if there is, how do I get it? Uh, three weeks talking about the big questions of life. Now, some of you did this uh, course when we did it in the, in the fall and you actually form the greatest uh, uh, pool of people who would be primed to invite someone to come along with you this time. Um, or maybe it's you. Maybe it's you kind of sitting and saying, hey, you know what? I'd like to understand a little bit more uh, about some of these things than you are in invited. There are cards on the table uh, in the foyer that I would encourage you to, to take, use as invites, take for yourself. Uh, you can find more information on our website uh, about all of that. All right. So that's the administrative stuff. That's all the uh, announcements and things that are important for you to remember. And we write them all down here so that you can remember them and so that you can not think about them now. Uh, because now is when we transition to, to worship. So you can, you can physically do it as a reminder, but at least mentally do this. Uh, turn the bulletin over. Right? In other words, turn away from the announcements and the logistics and all of those kinds of things and turn to the reason why we're here. Uh, we are here to worship. And the inside of your bulletin lays out how we will do that this morning. And as we begin, let me invite you uh, to just take a moment to silently come before God, to be praying and asking that he would be at work in your heart and in the hearts of those who are around you, because we're glad that we're here together. call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 149, verses 1 and 2. The Lord commands us, praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise in the assembly of the godly. Let Israel be glad in his maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. Let's pray together. Gracious God, you are our king, our ruler, our savior, our sovereign Lord, and our source of forgiveness through Jesus Christ. And we praise you, Lord, for you have indeed blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. You've chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before you in love. And Lord, we thank you that we are your children through Jesus Christ, adopted according to the good pleasure of your will, to the praise of your glorious grace that you have freely bestowed on us. And so, Lord, now may all of us say and do this morning in everything in a way that honors you, even as we pray that it might challenge and strengthen and encourage us, that every prayer that is prayed, every song sung, every word of your scripture read, and as we celebrate the sacraments, Lord, may it all honor you, and may it encourage our souls as we consider the goodness you've shown to us in Christ, or we pray in his name, amen. This first song that we are about to sing is written by an author that has been lost to history, we don't know, written in the mid-1700s, but it is a song that speaks of the God of Christianity, a God in three persons, an almighty, glorious Father, an incarnate Word, and a holy Comforter, our God, three in one, eternal praises be to Him. Let's stand and sing.
seated. And take your order of worship or look at the screens behind me and we will look at uh, the corporate confession of sin and the assurance of pardon that are printed there. We come to the Lord's table this morning and one of the things that is appropriate to do when we do that is to examine ourselves, our own hearts, to recognize that we fall short of God's commands in so many areas. And yet because of what Jesus has done, we are able to find forgiveness in his work. And so let's read these words together, this corporate uh, confession of sin. It's taken from uh, two questions of our Westminster uh, Larger Catechism. And then let's uh, take a moment and silently pray. Ask God to, uh, to come before us, uh, to ask God to, to forgive those areas of our life where we know uh, that we have fallen short of his uh, perfect standard. And then we'll hear together uh, the assurance of pardon. Let's pray together. No man is able, either of himself or by any grace received in this life, perfectly to keep the commandments of God, but does daily break them in thought, word, and deed. Every sin, even the least, being against the sovereignty, goodness, and holiness of God, and against the righteous law, deserves his wrath and curse, both in this life and that which is to come, and cannot be expiated but by the blood of Christ. Silently pray together now. We have fallen short of his standards. We are unable to keep his law. And yet, Isaiah the prophet foretold of one who would come and bear the burdens and the iniquity of his people. And he spoke of him like this, saying, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. This is the confidence, the assurance of our salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. This is the grace that God has shown to us. This is his amazing love and we should never cease to be amazed by the love that God has shown to us and the extent that he would go in Christ to forgive our sins. Amazing love. How can it be that thou my God shouldst die for me? Let's stand and sing together.
completed. It's in response to a love like that that God's people gives to the work of, of His church to be able to help proclaim this message to a world that desperately needs to hear about the amazing love of God. So this is our opportunity to recognize that as an act of worship. Whether you give by putting something in the plate now or by some other means, use this opportunity to reflect on what God has given to you and the obligation, the privilege that we have to give back a portion of that to the service of his church. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gifts that you have given to us, the gifts of your amazing love and the person of Jesus Christ and the resources that you provide us to be able to live in this world. Lord, as we give back just a small portion of those resources to the work of your church, we pray that you would use them. Use them to benefit this local congregation, the ministries in our community that we support, the missionaries around the world that proclaim the amazing love of God. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. On the first Sunday of the month in our pastoral prayer, we pray for specific needs within our congregation. Now, this, of course, isn't the only time when specific needs arise, and we have a, a prayer chain that uh, is sent out via email to people in our congregation who pray for needs whenever they happen. Uh, but specifically during this time, we lift these needs up in the context of public worship and invite you to join with me as I pray aloud in praying for these things. They're just a sampling. There are many needs, most of our needs, completely unspoken here in this prayer and in this room, and yet very known to the God to whom we pray. So let's bow and come before him. Our Father, we thank you for the privilege of prayer. We thank you that you know each and every one of us, all of our circumstances, all of our situations, all of our joys, and all of our sorrow. You know the specific needs in our lives. You know our grief. You know our uncertainties and you know our questions and so Lord as we lift up just some of these things specifically we pray that you would be with uh, each of the needs that are unspoken each of the prayers that we pray individually each of the things that you know that may not be said Lord with that we do pray for some of the things that our church has been praying for over the last uh, month we pray and we uh, grieve and mourn uh, with Rob and his family of the death of his mother last month we pray for comfort for the family for hope in the resurrection a, a hope that was shared by Rob's mom and we pray Lord would be shared by all who struggle with the grief of her passing we praise you Lord for Mary Ann and for the news in this last month that she does not need a further chemotherapy following her surgery we pray for continued recovery recovery that she would be forever free of this cancer we pray for Ma michelle for perseverance and healthy habits as the new year begins and particularly as he she begins her counseling practicum uh, in the coming weeks we pray that she'd be able to manage uh, the the time to learn the tasks that she'll be performing that you give her wisdom and patience as she meets with clients and learns the skills that she might need to be able to help them and finally, Lord, specifically, we pray for Rose, that she would continue to experience uh, your uh, help in the midst of ongoing health issues. We pray for continued medical questions and that you would bring resolution to her living situation. Lord, for all of these needs that we raise, we pray, Lord, that we would look for ways as people in this church to help one another and that you would help us to identify specific things that we might be able to do 
not the least of which, regularly praying for one another. Help us to be in one another's lives so that we might be able to do that and to do that well. Lord, all of this help, all of these requests are possible only because we come to you, the God of all the universe, who has revealed to us your nature, your character, your salvation in the pages of Scripture. We have no basis to be able to pray to a God that we do not know, a God that we cannot trust. We do know you, and we can trust you, and we can do that because of what you revealed to us in your word. And so, Lord, as we come to study your word, we pray that you would open our hearts and our eyes to be able to see and understand the things that you wish to teach us. Take these words that I speak based on your word and use them with effectiveness in the hearts of people who are listening and apply by your Holy Spirit everything that might be said that is true and block out from the minds and the memories anything that I might say that is misleading or unhelpful. Lord, help us to be attentive to your word, we pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let me invite you to to take a Bible, either your own Bible or one that's in the chair racks uh, in front of you, uh, and turn to 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11. Now, if you're using a Bible on the rack in front of you, you can find 1 Kings 11 on page 370. And this is what we're going to do this morning. We're going to use 1 Kings 11 to do two things. We're going to use it first to set up Uh, the reception of new members and celebration of the Lord's Supper that's going to happen uh, in a little bit. That's the first thing it's going to set up. The preaching of the Word always does that. When we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we preach the Word because it sets up, it gives context to to, to what we do when we come to the table. But the second thing, the second purpose of looking at 1 Kings 11 this morning is with a little bit of a longer horizon. Uh, We're going to be studying over the next few months um, in the Bible uh, this uh, this, uh, uh, this book, first, the end of 1 Kings and the, and the entirety of 2 of Kings. Now, we're not going to look at every chapter in it, uh, but we are going to survey it to understand uh, how God was faithful to the people of Israel in the years and the centuries following uh, the death of King Solomon. And there'll be plenty of time to get into all of that, but what I want to do this morning is I want to rewind and look at 1 Kings 11, which is where we see the last days of King Solomon. 1 Kings 11 is actually... Uh, the, the chapter that we ended with back in 2022 when we studied the reign of King Solomon. Remember the sermon series from 2002? Me neither, really. Yeah. Right, at least not in detail. So that's where we're going to rewind in order to go, to go forward, right? And the way that I want to do that is a bit different, and it's going to be a bit painful for uh, the person doing the, the, the slides, but uh, through the first part of this, we're going to read this text. It's a very long text in 1 Kings 11. We're going to read it kind of in pieces, and we'll stop uh, as we go, and we'll make a, a couple of comments. Uh, the, the, first, the first part of what we're going to do in reading through 1 Kings 11 and commenting on it is really to review and do some analysis of Solomon's big problems. He had some big problems uh, towards the end of his life, uh, and as we read through the text, we're going to we're going to see that, and that's going to set up the division that will, that will occur following his death and what we'll be studying this winter. And then after that, after we read through the text in, in pieces and we talk about Solomon's big problems, we're going to run through a quick list of big lessons that I think we can learn as a, as a church, as members of the church, uh, as people who come to celebrate the Lord's Supper together, um, and as we enter the new year together. So that's what we're going to do, big problems and, and big lessons. Now first, as we read through this text, let's look at these big problems. Let's, let's walk through this text in pieces, and we'll start with verses 1 to 13. So if you have your Bible open, right, start chapter uh, 11 of 1 Kings, uh, starting at verse 1, we're going to read about Solomon's personal problems to start. 1 Kings 11, starting at verse 1. Listen to God's word. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women, from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. 
So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not wholly follow the Lord as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites, on the mountain east of Jerusalem. And so he did for all his foreign wives who made offerings and sacrificed to their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods. But he did not keep what the Lord commanded. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, Since this has been your practice, and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. Yet for the sake of David your father, I will not do it in your days, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of David my servant and for the sake of Jerusalem that I have chosen. This is God's word. Now, for the first problem, the foundational problem we see here, Solomon turned away from God. Specifically, his heart turned away from God. All right, you see that. It starts with his love. It says in verse 1, his love for foreign women. And even if you could, even if you could rationalize the 700 wives of royal birth as somehow some sort of political uh, strategic uh, scheme, which you can't, by the way. You can't, rational, <laughs> can't rationalize that away. But even if you could try... The 300 concubines, mistresses who didn't even meet the status of a wife, that would tip you off, if that's all you had, to the fact that Solomon had a big problem here. And it's not the external sin that's actually of most concern. It's the fact that his heart was not devoted to God, right? He set up places of worship to foreign gods. Started, obviously, in response to requests from his, his wives, and then he ended up participating in them as well. And God, justifiably, is angered by this angered because it was in direct contradiction of his law a law that god had put in place to protect the dignity of his name and to protect the happiness of humanity that's why god gave gave the people of israel his law and solomon's heart had turned away from it he had serious personal problems right that's the first set that's the first big problem he had now second let's keep reading let's look at verse 14 he also had some political problems right so this is first kings 11 starting at verse 14 i'll read through the end of verse 25 and the Lord raised up an adversary against Solomon, Hadad the Edomite. He was of the royal house in Edom. For when David was in Edom, and Joab, the commander of the army, went up to bury the slain, he struck down every male in Edom. For Joab and all Israel remained there six months until he had cut off every male in Edom. But Hadad fled to Egypt together with certain Edomites of his father's servants, Hadad still being a little child. They set out from Midian and came to Paran and took men with them from Paran and came to Egypt to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who gave him a house and assigned him an allowance of food and gave him land. And Hadad found great favor in the sight of Pharaoh, so that he gave him in marriage the sister of his own wife, the sister of Topanes, the queen. And the sister of Topanes bore him Genoboth, his son, whom Topanes weaned in Pharaoh's house. And Genoboth was in Pharaoh's house among the sons of Pharaoh. But when Hadab heard in Egypt that David slept with his fathers and that Joab, the commander of the army, was dead, Hadad said to Pharaoh, Let me depart that I may go to my own country. But Pharaoh said to him, What have you lacked with me that you are now seeking to go to your own country? And he said to him, Only let me depart. And God raised up as an adversary to him, Rezon the son of Eliada, who had fled from his master Hadadezar, king of Zobah. And he gathered men about him and became leader of a marauding band after the killing by David. And they went to Damascus and lived there and made him king in Damascus. He was an adversary of Israel all the days of Solomon, doing harm as Hadad did. And he loathed Israel and reigned over Syria. This also is God's word. Now, God raises up, you know, all the details and stuff, right? You're, it's going to be a struggle to remember, right? But this is the point. God raises up two men to struggle against Solomon. Two problems, political problems. Neither of these men are Israelites. You've got Hadad in the south. He's an Edomite. Edomites were descendants of Esau, the brother of Jacob, who was the father of the, of the Israelites, right? So you've got bad blood that goes back in these families a long way. And Hadad specifically, Hadad the Edomite, was a victim of David's wars, Solomon's father, and was apparently waiting for David's death to come back from exile in Egypt to cause trouble. And that's what he did for Solomon came back, a political enemy of Solomon's father David, came back to cause trouble in Israel. Now, Rezon, this other guy, right, if, 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 if Hadad is in the south, Rezon is in the north in the kingdom of Zobah. 
Now, this too, this hostility is also rooted in David's wars. Rezan apparently had never accepted defeat at the hand of David, and he formed a band of sort of guerrilla warfare, uh, guerrilla warriors to trouble Solomon based out of Damascus. Right? So you've got political problems. The point is you've got political problems for Solomon from the outside. You've got his own personal heart, right? That was number one. Now you've got external political problems. Now, he also had he also had political problems on the inside. We'll call these legacy problems, right? What's going to happen after he, after he dies? Let's keep reading. Now, verse 26. Verse 26, going to verse 40, okay? Jeroboam, right? So now we're talking about people internal to the kingdom. Jeroboam, the son of Naboth, an Ephraimite of Zeradah, a servant of Solomon, whose mother's name was Zerah, a widow, also lifted up his hand against the king. And this was the reason why he lifted up his hand against the king. Solomon built the millow and closed up the breach of the city of David, his father. The man Jeroboam was very able, and when Solomon saw that the young man was industrious, he gave him charge over all the forced labor of the house of Joseph. And at that time, when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem, the prophet Ahijah the Shilonite found him on the road. Now Ahijah had dressed himself in a new garment, and the two of them were alone in the open country. Then Ahijah laid hold of the new garment that was on him and tore it into 12 pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, Take for yourself 10 pieces, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I am about to tear the kingdom from the hand of Solomon and will give you 10 tribes. But he shall have one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city that I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. Because they have forsaken me and worshiped the Ashtoreth, Worshipped Ashereth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of Moab, and Milcon, the god of the Ammonites, and they have not walked in my ways, doing what is right in my sight, and keeping my, father, uh, keeping my statutes and my rules, as David my father did. Nevertheless, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but I will make him ruler all the days of his life for the sake of David my servant, whom I chose, who kept my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom out of his son's hand and will give it to you ten tribes, Yet to his son I will give one tribe, that David my servant may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem, the city where I have chosen to put my name. And I will take you, and you shall reign over all that your soul desires, and you shall be king over Israel. And if you will listen to all that I command you, and you walk in my ways, and do what is right in my eyes by keeping my statutes and my commandments, as David my servant did, I will be with you, and will build you a sure house, as I built for David, and I will give Israel to you. And I will afflict the offspring of David because of this, but not forever. Solomon sought, therefore, to kill Jeroboam. But Jeroboam arose and fled into Egypt to Shishak, king of Egypt, who was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. All right, now this is foreshadowing stuff that we're going to talk about in coming weeks. Kingdom divides after Solomon, and here's, here's, here's how it's, it's going to happen. But the point for us in looking at the problems of Solomon, he had political problems from the outside, yeah historical enemies that weren't Israelites, but Jeroboam is from the inside. He was an Israelite from the tribe of Ephraim, and he was a rising star. He was a hot prospect in Solomon's government. He had a significant role in the king's construction projects, but in response to Solomon's idolatry and in Solomon's turning away from God, God speaks to Jeroboam through the prophet and tells him that he's going to become king over 10 of the original tribes of Egypt. Now, it's not going to happen until after Solomon dies. It's going to be a problem for Solomon's son to deal with, but that doesn't keep Solomon from trying to deal with Jeroboam, to kill Jeroboam. And that's what he tries to do. Right? All kinds of terrible political internal problems. Jeroboam escapes. He goes to Egypt. He flees there. He bides his time until Solomon dies, which, of course, eventually happens. Now, that leads us to the very end of the chapter, <laughs> the, the ultimate problem that Solomon and all of us face. Finish the chapter, verse 41 to 43. Now, the rest of the acts of Solomon and all that he did and his wisdom... Are they not written in the book of the Acts of Solomon? And the time that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel was 40 years. And Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, his father. And Rehoboam, his son, reigned in his place. This concludes the reading of God's word. Now that's what happened. That's what went wrong. Solomon's love shifted from God to, to other things. And in judgment, God raised up enemies. Enemies from the outside, enemies from the inside. And that, those enemies and Solomon's own actions as king eventually led to a kingdom that would split apart. And then Solomon died. Boom. I mean, that's, that's where some pastor ended the sermon series in 2022. On that very cheery note, what kind of a depressing pastor would do something like that? Right? 
These are big problems, very big problems. And over the coming weeks, we'll talk about God's faithfulness in the midst of what occurs next. But just real quickly as we end here, let's maybe glean a couple of lessons from this as we start the new year together. What can we learn from this? What are the big lessons? Well, I think there's, I think there's five. Let's tick through them. Five lessons that we can learn. Lesson number one, cracks start small. The kingdom will crack. It will break apart, but the cracks start small. In other words, we fall into sin long before we fall into disgrace. Think of it like this. If you were to get, go over to Wall Municipal Airport and get on an airplane, because I know that's where you keep your private jet, and you were to fly uh, due, uh, due west, and were attempt to go entirely around the world and land in the same spot. But you took off and you were just one degree off. Just one degree. There's 360, right, in a full circle. You're just one degree off. And you flew all the way around the world. You know how far off you'd be by the time you got back to this hemisphere? About 450 miles, north or south, depending on which way you went. To the north, that's like north of Ottawa, Canada. Right? Just a small degree of difference at the beginning results in a very big de degree of difference as time goes on, right? That's what happens. Think about this spiritually, right? Every day you make decisions that in that instant seem to make no per perceptible difference, but when you put them out over a lifetime, you end up in a very different country <laughs> from where you intended to land. That's what happened to, to Solomon. Now, this is what can happen to us if we're not careful, right? No pilot flying over the world would ever expect to stay on course and land in the same place unless that pilot is regularly making adjustments the entire flight, corrections, even autopilot, even if it's not the pilot doing it. That's what autopilot is doing, constantly adjusting for wind speed and course and navigation to stay on the correct course. The lesson that we can learn from Solomon here is to make your corrections while the differences are small. Take sin seriously when it's small, not in a legalistic way, right? Showing others how morally superior you are, right? But because you love God, because you hate anything, even if it's small, that could take you off course. That's lesson number one. Lesson number two, gifts aren't enough. Great spiritual gifts, they're not enough. In other words, your giftedness does not guarantee the condition of your heart, right? Did the question ever occur to you in all of this, if Solomon was so wise, so brilliant, right? We call Solomon, Solomon the wise. If he was so wise, if he was so brilliant, how could he, of all people, done these things. His wisdom was a gift from God. And there were times, many times, when his wisdom was, was beautifully, brilliantly on display. But see, too often we confuse a person's gifts with a person's heart. Right? Solomon didn't fall because what he wrote in the Proverbs was wrong. He fell because he failed to be in love with the God to whom those Proverbs pointed. So what do we do? Well, if you're evaluating your own spiritual condition right then you have to understand you have to your external productivity is not the measure of your internal spiritual heart your external productivity can be very misleading you can be serving in all kinds of important ways but that in and of itself may not speak to the condition of your heart honestly ask yourself this question this is the this is the the lesson right what's the condition of my attitude towards god what is the greatest object of my affection stick to the aviation metaphor right i'm not talking about your, your, your distance from the final destination. I'm not talking about your speed. I'm not talking about the course. I'm talking about what instrument will you use to judge whether you're off course or not. The instrument that you use to judge whether you're off course or not is not your gift-o-meter or your productivity-o-meter. It is a heart-meter. And only the Scripture and the power of the Holy Spirit and the community of other people can help you with that. Now, it's pretty depressing if we just stop there, those lessons, okay, I'm just, I, you actually think about your own life and you're like, one degree, man, I'm probably off a lot more than that. Where am I going to end up? Well, well let's see, let, 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 there's more lessons. Lesson three, lesson three, God's in control. You hear that? God's in complete control. And we see that specifically in the case of the discipline that he's promising, promising to bring against Solomon's kingdom. If you go back and you look at verse 35, where God is talking through the prophet to Jeroboam, right? See how he phrases it. He says, I will take the kingdom out of his son's hands, out of Solomon's hands, and I will give it to you, that is Jeroboam, ten tribes. You see that? Who's in control of all this that's happening? God is. He's the one who's going to take it, and he's going to give it. He hasn't relinquished control, not for a second. Now, at a broader level, that should be somewhat comforting to all of us during any time of political uncertainty, nationally, internationally, whatever. But at a personal level, 
as you consider your own life. Right? It also means that God is in complete control even of your disobedience and its consequences. Right? This is what I mean. This is why this is so comforting. If you're suffering through the consequences of personal sin, poor decisions in your own life, fractured relationships, right, addictions, destructive behavior, and they're your fault. Or if you're suffering through the consequences of sin more broadly, like disease, like the prospect of, of physical death, or if you're suffering because of the sin and the consequences of something that has been done against you or to you, in any of those categories where you may be suffering, hope starts with the truth that there is a God who is sovereignly ruling over all of it. And that's really, that's really helpful when we think about the why questions of our lives. We may not be able to get into the specifics of why we are experiencing particular areas of suffering, but a God who is in control tells us that there is one to whom we can go in the midst of those questions. That's lesson three. God's still in control. Now, lesson number four, God's not done. And, 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 and he's not done with his promise to David and to Solomon. And that means that he's not done with his promises to you. Look at verse 39, right? Yes, Solomon's kingdom is going to experience the consequences of sin. But there's a but. Did you see? I, there's a but. I will afflict the offspring of David because of this, but not forever. What's that mean? Right? Go back to verse 35, which we just read. I will take the kingdom out of his son's hands. I will give it to you ten tribes. Now keep reading. Yet to his son I will give one tribe that David, my servant, may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem, the city where I chose to put my name. What's happening? Judgment is coming. The kingdom of Solomon is going to be split. But the judgment is on a leash. And it will be mitigated. It will be directed. It will be controlled by God's faithfulness to a promise. A promise that was made way back to the patriarch Jacob, Israel himself, that the scepter, the, 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 the rule of the king, would not depart from Jacob's son Judah. And it was because of that promise that God chose David, Solomon's father, from the tribe of Judah to be king. And it was to David that God extended the promise of a forever king through his line. You still got your Bible, right? If you can, turn to this. We're going to keep coming back to this promise a number of times this winter. It's the most, one of the most important passages in the history of Israel. 2 Samuel chapter 7. Right? 2 Samuel is the book before 1 Kings. Right? I want to remind you of this connection so often that it's almost automatic. 2 Samuel 7, starting in the middle of verse 11. This is God speaking to David through the prophet Nathan. The Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Right? You see what he's saying here? Solomon did wrong, but that wrong did not surprise God. And it doesn't negate the promise. The kingdom of David's son Solomon, the lamp in Jerusalem, it's going to continue, right? And you go to Matthew chapter 1, and you look at just one verse in Matthew chapter 1, verse 7, and what does it say? It says, Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, right? Solomon's name, where is it located? In a list of names in the genealogy of who? The genealogy of Jesus. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. Jesus is the son of, of who? He's the son of Solomon. God wasn't done. Things are going to get very bleak for the people of God, right? The unity of the kingdom is going to be broken. There's going to be a few good kings we'll look at this winter, not very many, but God's not done. The prophets would largely be ignored throughout the centuries that were, were to come, but God wasn't done. He kept his promises. He preserved the tribe of Judah. He preserved the line of David and Solomon because it was from that line that Messiah would come. And folks, that's where our hope is. As we come and as we align ourselves with this God, that's where our hope is, that God isn't done, that there is a Messiah who takes away our sin, who wipes away all of our iniquity. And so when we put our trust and our faith in Him, we can have the assurance that God is not only not done with the world, He is not done with us. 
Come to him in the midst of your big problems and you will find the solution that only he can provide. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the truth of who you are and that in the midst of the problems that we face, you are active, you are working, and that you will not fail to be faithful to your promises. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we did a little bit different in the order of worship, what we normally do when we receive new members. And I'm actually going to add even just a little bit uh, in here now. I want to uh, recognize, is Rodrigo here? He went to get Samuel? All right. Krista and Rodrigo Payne are here visiting with us this morning. Krista and Rodrigo, before we even, before we even um, recognize new members, um, they were able to visit. I wasn't sure whether they would actually be able to make it, so I didn't put it in the bulletin, didn't make it. Um, but Krista and Rodrigo have an interesting story that I think is really helpful to hear as we talk about membership. Um, because Krista came here, she moved to the area to work, uh, she started attending our church, she became a member. Uh, she told us about this guy that she was getting to know named Rodrigo. Uh, Rodrigo came and visited, we got to know Rodrigo. Uh, they were engaged and they were preparing to be married and I got to perform their wedding ceremony in the midst of the, the, like the, the darkest days of COVID from a social distance. And they started to, a, they started to attend this church as a, as a, as a married couple. And they bought a house in the Princeton Junction area, which is a little bit of a drive from here. And we talked from the very beginning and we said, you know, that's a little bit of a distance. It may not be the, the place for you to be able to worship over a long period of time. And they said, no, we understand that. But in the earliest days of our marriage, we want to continue to start attending here to, to build this as our foundation. We want to be faithful members of Calvary. And they were. And then they had a son and we baptized that child here and, and, uh, and, and the time did come where they said, you know, it's, we're, we're getting more in, uh, in, in depth in our community here and we think it'd be appropriate for us to look for a church in our area. And they came to us as the leaders in the church and said, help us to, to do that. And we did and we prayed for them, we prayed with them. And they've been attending Hope Presbyterian Church in, in Lawrenceville, closer to their home and in the midst of their community. And they were recently received a couple of weeks ago into membership at that church. Now, we don't do this for everyone who leaves the church, but I mention it because it is a really important understanding of when you become a member, how to leave as a member. To be connected to the church that you're leaving, to help explain and uh, help them understand what it is you're doing so that they can, the church can continue to remain a spiritually active part of your life and then joyfully hand you off to the care of another church. So, Chris Rodrigo, Samuel, can you come up? I want to pray for you, and I want to just pray for you as you transition to membership in, a, in another church. And I want to make the connection between this and what we're, what we're doing. And let's pray for these no longer members of our church, but, but part of our family nonetheless. Father, we thank you for Krista, for Rodrigo, for Samuel, and for the little baby that you're bringing into their family in the coming weeks. We pray, Lord, that you would bless them as they worship and as they serve at hope. We thank you for the joy that it is to be able to see you at work in the lives of people in our church and to send them out uh, to do your work in other places. Thank you for your faithfulness to them and to the church of Jesus Christ, for it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, guys. Now I want to invite up a number of young people. Your names are listed in the bulletin. I'll go through them in a second. But if your name is on that list, come up here and and line up right here, right? I need to, Mia, John, Nate, Abby, Essie, Zion, Sammy, Jack. You don't have to be in that order, but come on up and, and let's line up across here, right? You're so big. It's, it's so long. It's not even going to fit into the, into the camera shot. Now, let me, let me just explain for a second, right? And forgive me to just take a minute, right? When I, when I first became a member of a church, it was in a, a, a church that had a sixth grade confirmation class, right? Everyone who was in sixth grade, uh, no, yeah, sixth grade, I'm pretty sure. Maybe it was eighth grade, actually. I don't know. But everybody, everybody in that class, they all went to the confirmation class, and they all, did it, they all did it together. And when you were done, you were done, and everyone became members of the church. Now, theoretically, you had a decision to make, but that was kind of just the way things happened. We don't do that here. Now, that class was very beneficial uh, for, for me. I learned a lot of things from it. I was not a Christian when I came out of that class. I didn't understand what it meant to have a relationship with, with Jesus Christ. And here at Calvary, we allow through the workings of the children and their families, 
the children to come to, to us, to have conversations within their families and say, hey, I'm understanding, I'm asking questions. I believe in Jesus. I'd like to understand more. What does it mean to be a part of God's church? And while they all stand up here today at different times over the last couple of years, it's exactly what's happened in each of these, these, these situations. Each of these young people have come to the place in their own lives where they look at what we talk about every week in the gospel that we preach and they say, I believe that. I want to put my faith and trust in that Savior. When I see this Lord's Supper celebrated every week, I want to participate in that. Right? This is a hugely meaningful thing. Each of them have been baptized as younger children in the Church of Jesus Christ. You hear it when we do baptisms. We did one in December. Baptism does not save. It does not wash away someone's sins. But it points to the washing work of Jesus Christ that does wipe away our sins. And it puts a promise over a young person's life when it is administered to a child in the church. It puts a sign over their life that points them over and over again to the work of Jesus Christ until that day when that child, in their own mind, and with their own will changed by the power of the Holy Spirit, embraces that promise as their own and puts their faith in Jesus Christ and aligns themselves as a communing member here in Christ's church. That's what we have in front of us. Let me go through, and we got, we got, we got little pictures for, for each of them. In the order of their, of their baptisms, Mia Lomanowicz, 2007, was baptized. Promise of God hung over her, pointing her to the work of Jesus Christ. Her brother John, in 2009, baptized. The promise of God hung over his life, pointing him to the work of Jesus Christ. Nate Schumann, baptized here in this church, October 2009. Family had just moved to Connecticut, but they weren't members of a church there. And so that promise put over him here in this room, pointing him to the work of Jesus Christ. Avi McGinnis, baptized May 2010 at 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia. The promise of God put over her life, pointing her to the work of Jesus Christ. S.E. Har, October 2010. Baptized in Wilmington at Faith Presbyterian Church. The promise of God put over her life, pointing her to the work of Jesus Christ. Zion Sanzone, December 2011. Baptized here in this church. The promise of God put over him, pointing him to the work of Jesus Christ. Sammy Schumann, his family having just moved to New York in this case, but still not members, baptized also in this very room here at Calvary, May 2012, the promise of God pointing him to Jesus Christ hung over his life. And finally, Jack Har, August 2012, baptized, the only one of them baptized actually by me at Faith Presbyterian Church in Wilmington, Delaware, the promise of God placed over his life. This is the promise we celebrate. And the membership vows that are printed for them are for you as well. They highlight the commitment that everyone makes when they come and make a public profession of Jesus Christ. And so, to all of you, I'm going to ask you these questions. You've been asked these questions before in the class that we did together. You've been asked these questions in interviews with our elders. But now you answer these questions publicly before God's people. After each of them, I'll stop and invite you to say yes. Do you acknowledge yourself to be a sinner in the sight of God, justly deserving his displeasure and without hope, save in his sovereign mercy? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners? And do you receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he is offered in the gospel? Do you now resolve and promise in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as becomes a follower of Christ? Do you promise to support the church in its worship and work to the best of your ability? And do you submit yourself to the government and discipline of the church and promise to study its purity and peace? Now, before I pray for them, I'm going to invite Danny Ann Alonis to come up and join them. Danny, we recognized um, a couple of weeks ago as a new member of the church. Um, now, Danny went through a different membership process. Danny is, is an adult now, right? Right? But Danny, too, along with them, all baptized in the church, celebrating today for the very first time with God's people the Lord's Supper. It's a hugely significant moment. Let's pray that God would bless all of us as we come to the Lord's table, but specifically these nine, 
as they share in the table for the first time. Our Father, we thank you for the work that you have done in each of our hearts, bringing us to faith in you. And Lord, we pray that as we come to your table this morning, and for each of these young people who have put their faith and their trust in you, as they come for the very first time, that they truly would be able to discern the body and the blood of Christ, to see it as given and spilled for them. Lord, I pray that you would be at work in each of their lives as they grow in their faith. All of them, Lord, will experience different things that will cause them to to struggle, that will cause them to stretch. But Lord, in the midst of that, I pray that they would always be pulled back to you. Would you hold them close and hold them fast as they live a life dedicated to you? For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Let me invite you to return to your families as we prepare to celebrate the uh, the Lord's the Lord's Supper. And let's do that. This is a celebration here of God's people, and it is intended for all those who have put their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ. It's not restricted to those who are just members of this church, but you ought to be a member of a church where this gospel of Jesus Christ is preached and taught. If you're not, or if you're uncertain about whether you believe or not what God has said, what we've been talking about, then I encourage you to, to wait. Allow the elements to pass by. That's not a, something that's wrong. It's something that's encouraged. It's actually something, on the basis of the apostle's own words, something that you ought to do. Because these are the words that the apostle Paul said when the supper was instituted. Words that I have left up here. This is what the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, words that serve both as reminder and warning of what we are doing here today. He wrote that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the sacrament of which we're about to partake. We ask that you would bless it to us. Set aside this bread, this cup, and use them to remind us of the sacrifice you made on the cross and strengthen our faith for your service through it, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let me invite the elders to come up and join me up here who will help and assist in serving the supper uh, this morning. Uh, This is how we'll do it in each instance. First, we will pass around the the bread. Uh, We ask that you would hold it, take it, uh, until everyone has been served, and then we will participate and partake uh, together. Uh, And then we will, after everyone participates in the the bread, we'll pass around the cup. Uh, the cup will be, uh, there's, there's wine in the uh, tinted glasses, there's grape juice in the clear glasses, uh, and then you take, hold it, wait until everyone has been served, and then we will participate together. If you desire, when the bread is passed, to have a gluten-free uh, wafer, then just indicate there'll be a, a little dish in each of the baskets of, of those. So this is how we'll do it. We'll start with, the, start with the bread, because on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body which is given for you. Take and eat and as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. So ministering to you now in his name, we give you this bread.
the body of Christ given for you. Take and eat. In the same manner, after he had given thanks, Jesus took the cup and he gave it to his disciples and he said, this cup is the blood of the new covenant which is poured out for you and for the forgiveness of sins. Take, he said, and drink, and as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. So ministering to you now in his name, we give you this cup. blood of Christ poured out for you. Take and drink. It is our practice uh, on the Sundays when we celebrate the Lord's Supper to collect an offering that is to be used by our deacons to assist those in our congregation uh, and in our local community that have fallen upon difficult times. And so let me invite the ushers to come forward uh, as we take that offering. Uh, and I will pray for its use. Father, we thank you uh, for the gifts you give to us. We pray for those who are in financial need and require assistance. We pray that through these resources we might be able to provide and help with those things. Help us to show mercy because mercy has been shown to us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The last song that we're going to sing to close was written by Charles Spurgeon, the great Baptist preacher in London in the 1800s, and it is a communion hymn. It's to the tune of a 
uh, a more well-known uh, hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, but it speaks specifically to what we do here when we come to the Lord's table. So let's stand and let's uh, conclude our service uh, beginning with this song. you to come downstairs and join us for lunch together, but whether you go now or go later, let this be a blessing upon you as you go. These words uh, from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 23 and 24, it also serve as a blessing upon our meal as we fellowship together. Now may peace be to you, my brothers and sisters, in love with faith. From God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with a love incorruptible. Amen.